The flesh is linked with Adam, the spirit with Christ. Leaving aside now settled the question of whether we are in Adam or in Christ, we must ask ourselves, am I living in the flesh or in the spirit? To live in the flesh is to do something out from myself as in Adam. It is to derive strength from the old natural source of life that I inherited from him, so that I enjoy and experience all Adam's very complete provision for sinning, which all of us have found so effective. Now the same is true of what is in Christ. To enjoy in experience what is true of me as in him, I must learn what it is to walk in the Spirit. It is a historic fact that in Christ my old man was crucified. And it is a present fact that I am blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. But if I do not live in the Spirit, then my life may be quite a contradiction of the fact that I am in Christ. For what is true of me in him is not expressed in me. I may recognize that I am in Christ, but I may also have to face the fact that my old temper is very much in evidence. What is the trouble? It is that I am holding the truth merely objectively, whereas what is true objectively must be made true subjectively, and that is brought about as I live in the Spirit. Am I in Christ, but Christ is in me? And just as physically a man cannot live and work in water, but only in air, so spiritually Christ dwells and manifests himself not in flesh, but in spirit. Therefore, if I live after the flesh, I find that what is mine in Christ is, so to say, held in suspense in me. Though in fact I am in Christ, Yet if I live in the flesh, that is in my own strength and under my own direction, then in experience I find to my dismay that it is what is in Adam that manifests itself in me. If I would know in experience all that is in Christ, then I must learn to live in the Spirit. Living in the Spirit means that I trust the Holy Spirit to do in me what I cannot do myself. This life is completely different from the life that I would naturally live of myself. Each time I am faced with a new demand from the Lord, I look to Him to do in me what He requires of me. It is not a case of trying, but of trusting, not of struggling, but of resting in Him. If I have a hasty temper, impure thoughts, a quick tongue, or a critical spirit, I shall not set out with a determined effort, effort to change myself. But, reckoning myself dead in Christ to these things, I shall look to the Spirit of God to produce in me the needed purity or humility or meekness. This is what it means to stand still and see the salvation of the Lord which he will work for you. The divine way of victory does not permit of our doing anything at all, anything that is to say outside of Christ. This is because as soon as we move we run into danger, for our natural inclinations take us in the wrong direction. Where then are we to look for help? Turn now to Galatians 5, verse 17. The flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. In other words, the flesh does not fight against us, but against the Holy Spirit, for these are contrary one to the other. And it is he, not we, who meets and deals with the flesh. What is the result? That ye may not do the things that ye would. I think we have often understood that last clause of this verse in a wrong sense. Let us consider what it means. What would we do naturally? 
we would move off on some course of action dictated by our own instincts and apart from the will of God. The effect then of our refusal to act out from ourselves is that the Holy Spirit is free to meet and deal with the flesh in us, with the result that we shall not do what we naturally would do. That is, we shall not act according to our natural inclinations. We shall not go off on a course and plan of our own, but shall find instead our satisfaction in his perfect plan. Hence we have the principle, walk by the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. If we live in the Spirit, if we walk by faith in the risen Christ, we can truly stand aside while the Spirit gains new victories over the flesh every day. He has been given to us to take charge of this business. Our victory lies in hiding in Christ and in counting in simple trust upon his Holy Spirit to overcome in us our fleshly lusts with his own new desires. The cross has been given to procure salvation for us. The Spirit has been given to produce salvation in us. Christ risen and ascended is the basis of our salvation. Christ in our hearts by the Spirit is its power. I thank God through Jesus Christ. That exclamation of Paul's is fundamentally the same as his other words in Galatians 2.20, which we have te taken as the key to our study. I live, and yet no longer I, but Christ. We saw how prominent is the word I throughout his argument in Romans 7, culminating in the agonized cry, O wretched man that I am. Then follows the shout of deliverance, Thank God, Jesus Christ. And it is clear that the discovery Paul has made is this, that the life we live is the life of Christ alone. We think of the Christian life as a changed life, but it is not that. God offers us an exchanged life, a substituted life, and Christ is our substitute within. I live, and yet no longer I, but Christ liveth in me. This life is not something which we ourselves have to produce. It is Christ's own life we produced in us. How many Christians believe in reproduction in this sense, as something more than regeneration? Regeneration means that the life of Christ is planted in us by the Holy Spirit at our new birth. Reproduction goes further. It means that that new life grows and becomes manifest progressively in us until the very likeness of Christ begins to be reproduced in our lives. That is what Paul means when he speaks of his travail for the Galatians, until Christ be formed in you. God will not give me humility or patience or holiness or love as separate gifts of his grace. He is not a retailer dispensing grace to us in doses, measuring out some patience to the impatient, some love to the unloving, some meekness to the proud, in quantities that we take and work on as a kind of capital. He has given only one gift to meet all our need, his Son, Christ Jesus. And as I look to him to live out his life in me, he will be humble and patient and loving and everything else I need in my stead. Remember the word in the first epistle of John, God gave unto us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath the life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not the life. The life of God is not given us as a separate item. The life of God is given us in the Son. It is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Our relationship to the Son is our relationship to the life.